Welcome to this lesson on more of the same, continuity in the Renaissance. Remember that continuity is where things change very little or stay the same in history. Our aims in this lesson are to identify examples of continuity in the medical Renaissance and to explain the reasons for continuity. Here's a do now task. Study the source to the left. This is a Renaissance woodcut of midwives delivering a baby. A woodcut was an image that was carved into a piece of wood so that it could be printed many times. Firstly, describe what you can see, including what the people are doing and any equipment that you can see. Secondly, what examples of continuity from the Middle Ages can you see? I'll go through some of the main points in a moment, but for now, pause the video while you complete those tasks. One of the first things that you may have noticed is it's women who are helping to deliver this baby. Women still had many of the uh, duties of being midwives and delivering babies in uh, the Renaissance times, as they did in the Middle Ages, and so that's an example of continuity right away. Secondly, you may have noticed some of the basic tools that they had. These again were very similar to the times of the Middle Ages. For example, we can see a pair of pliers there. Well, they're not really pliers, I'm joking. But those are, are, are what we call basic forceps, which are used for helping deliver the baby if it is struggling to be born. And what about in the background here? What are these people doing? Well, chances are these are doctors and they are studying a star chart. Basically, what they're performing is astrology. They're working out what star sign the baby is. At this time, astrology remained an important way of both diagnosing and also trying to work out what sort of personality someone would have. It's sort of the ancient equivalent of modern day horoscopes, although of course they were believed far more literally in these times. This again is an example of continuity from the Middle Ages. Here's another example, Renaissance surgery. Other examples of change, or mostly continuity with this. A reminder of the tools of the trade of the barber surgeon. A saw, a sharp curved knife, cauterizing irons, a block of wood, some alcohol, a rope, an apron, bandages and a mallet. In a moment I'm going to explain to you the process of a Renaissance uh, amputation. Your task will be to record these risks as headings first of all. Pain, infection, blood loss and shock. This can be remembered as PIBS, P-I-B-S, pain, infection, blood loss and shock. As I go through the process of the Renaissance amputation, you can record under these headings what measures are taken to manage these risks. So is there anything done to manage pain, infection, blood loss or shock during this particular procedure? So make notes underneath each heading. If any of the headings at the end of this are blank, then it may be that you've missed out something or it may simply be that there was not a lot that was done about that particular problem. After we've finished the demonstration, which risks are not being effectively addressed? And then have a think about this. How much does this represent change or continuity compared to the Middle Ages? Let's have a look at how the amputation was performed. Firstly, the patient was not anaesthetised. They may have been hit over the head, given some alcohol, although usually not for amputations because it thinned the blood, or just given a wooden block or strap of leather to bite down on. Right, you could pause this here and begin to make your notes. Alternatively, you could wait till I've done the whole demonstration and then try and do it from memory. It's up to you. Well, if we're carrying on, let's see the next stage. The surgeon would not take precautions to prevent infection. The cause of infection remained unknown at this time. Thirdly, speed was key. As we've covered, the main causes of death were pain, infection, blood loss and shock. Speed helped with the pain and the shock. The patient would be held down and a rope or cord tourniquet would be tied around the limb to be removed. This particular rope or cord tourniquet was all about restricting the blood going to that limb to make sure that the patient didn't bleed out during the operation. Fifthly, the surgeon would cut deep down to the bone in one swift movement using the curved knife, often reaching right around the leg, making the deep cut and drawing it round in one smooth go. Sixth, the flesh would be pulled back to reveal the bone. The surgeon quickly saws through the bone, removing the limb. Seven, the pulled back flesh is stretched over the bone to form a stump. Blood would be pouring out over the surgeon's apron at this time, even though the tourniquet had been applied. In fact, surgeons were quite proud of how bloody their aprons got because it was seen as evidence of their experience. Eight, 
the wound would be cauterised by hot irons. By the end of the Renaissance, blood vessels would be tied off with ligatures occasionally. These were silken threads. But cauterisation remained the most common form of preventing blood loss. 9. The stump would be wrapped round with bandages and, and that would soak up any remaining blood. Only then could the tourniquet be, be cautiously removed, but they would have to be ready to put it back on if the patient was still bleeding. Number 10. The patient would be left to recover. Success at this time was about 50-50, with infection from unwashed tools common, as was shock and loss of blood. Okay. So that's all of our different stages. Have a go at those tasks then. One, what measures are taken to reduce these risks? Makes notes underneath each heading. Secondly, which risks are not effectively addressed? And thirdly, how much does this represent change or continuity from the Middle Ages? Pause the video while you complete those things. So let's consider first of all how pain is man managed. Well, at best, they're just told to bite down on a block of wood or a, a leather strap and cope with it. A blow to the head might happen, and indeed, alcohol might be used for other um, smaller wounds, but probably for an amputation, that would be impossible. You'll notice in the picture that the person has passed out, but that's likely down to shock rather than actually any, any form of anaesthesia. In terms of preventing infection, well, there is no prevention of this. Because it wasn't understood what caused infection, nothing was done. In fact, it wouldn't even be uh, standard practice to thoroughly wash the hands or make sure that all the tools were clean. Blood loss? Well, they do do something about that to try and prevent it. We have the tourniquet, we have cauterisation, and later on we have these ligatures. And in terms of shock, speed is the only thing that they really do to manage this. Trying to get the uh, amputation over as quickly as possible was about as good as could be expected. An amputation, as described, might take only about 90 seconds to do. So, does this represent more change or more continuity? Both Renaissance and medieval barber surgeons used the same tools. Examples of a surgeon's toolkit can be seen in the picture that's just appeared. Explain why this might be the case. Secondly, does it show progression, regression or continuity? So, progression means that things are getting better. Regression means things were getting worse. Continuity means things that basically stayed the same. Whichever you think it is, explain why. Pause the video now while you complete these tasks, and then we'll have a look at some suggestions as to what you might have come up with. So for much of the Renaissance, there was continuity in surgery. Understanding about the cause of infection remained unknown, and so nothing could really be done between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance to try and prevent it. Effective anaesthetics remained a mystery too, and that was common between medieval times and the Renaissance. Surgeons remained unqualified, except for perhaps having a license from the church, again, unchanged from medieval times into the Renaissance. Ultimately, cutting bits of the body off, however, required pretty much the same kit as it ever did. Tools that were sharp and saws that were quick to cut through the bone. And that was pretty much it. Make any improvements to your answers that you need to, and then we'll move on. For this next task, we're going to consider these different factors of medicine and whether anything really changed in the Renaissance. If you're already completing plenty of this and you're using this for revision, it's a good opportunity to try and think about what changed and what stayed the same in each of these different areas. So have a go at this task if you can. If you've not yet studied the Renaissance in sufficient detail to do this, you can instead just think about what would be necessary for these things to progress. So consider each factor. What new medical understanding or technology would be needed for this factor to progress? Pause the video if you're going to have a go at that. Afterwards, we'll have a look at the summary of what would need to progress and whether or not that actually happened in the Renaissance. Let's firstly consider surgery. New ways of controlling pain and shock would be needed. These are called anaesthetics and of preventing bleeding. Well, this didn't happen in the Renaissance, apart from ligatures for bleeding. But actually, that didn't always help. Ligatures were just as prone to infection, if not more so. What about the knowledge of the human body? To progress in that, accurate knowledge of the body needed to be gained from human dissection. This actually happened though. Andreas Vesalius's Fabric of the Human Body did this. Again, if you've not studied Vesalius yet, you'll have to look that up. Healers. Knowledge of what medicines were, are effective against specific diseases would be needed. And this is related to the ideas about the causes of disease. 
knowledge of what actually causes specific illnesses and diseases was needed to bring progress. However, there was little here, a change here in the Renaissance. Everyday treatments involves knowledge of how to treat common illnesses. Again, there was very little change in this respect during the Renaissance. And for public health, the same. Knowledge of how to prevent common illnesses was needed, but again, there was little change. So what you can see here is all the ways in which these different factors largely had examples of continuity, with just a few changes and bits of progress in between. Some of this was quite significant progress, but the overall picture is one of continuity. Pause the video here if you need to improve your notes. If not, we'll move on. Let's have a look at the next task. In a moment, I'm going to reveal on screen, three at a time, different examples of continuity in the medical renaissance. You will need to arrange these different facts under headings, cause of disease, medical training, and treatment and prevention. Then, once you've done that, you can make an overall judgment. Overall, why was there so much continuity in renaissance medicine? Let's have a look at the first three facts. You're very welcome to pause this after I've done this and start making your notes, or you can wait until I've been through them all and do them all at once. It's up to you. There were still very few trained doctors around. Herbal remedies worked, and therefore people encouraged people to keep old ways of treating illness. And the church was still powerful, and people were told that God controlled every aspect of life, including illness. All right, you could pause the uh, task now, or you could just carry on. Here's, here's the next three. Uh, there will be 12 in total, by the way. Governments and kings did not believe it was their job to try and make people healthier or the towns cleaner, unless there were big outbreaks of plague. Wise women would often be the first person you consulted if you were ill, especially in the countryside. There was still a belief in the power of the supernatural making you ill. The work of Galen and other ancient healers was still an important part of medical training for doctors. Ideas about what had caused disease were often the same in the Renaissance as in the Middle Ages. And doctors had believed for so long in the accuracy of Galen, it was hard to change that view. Last three. Apothecaries were still used. Uh, remember, these were the people who would mix up often very exotic different medicines using different ingredients that they were able to find. Bleeding was still a very popular treatment to try and balance the humours. And physicians still believed in this idea of the four humours. So there they all are. You can pause the video here and make sure you've arranged all of them under those three headings. Cause of disease, medical training and treatment and prevention. In a moment you can press play again and then we'll have a look at which ones should be going where. But for now press pause while you complete this. So the first one was training. Next, treatment. Next, causes. Next, prevention. Next, treatment and training. So that one might go under two. Next, causes. Next, training. Another cause. Another one about training. This one's about treatment. Another treatment. And this one is both cause and treatment. So if you need to make any adjustments to your notes, now's your chance to do it. And don't forget that second task. Why was there so much continuity in the Renaissance? Pause the video while you make your corrections or do any additions. So why was there so much continuity in Renaissance medicine? Well, a lot of it will be down to the fact that the training remained pretty much the same until very late in the Renaissance. But possibly more importantly is that the cause of illness was still unknown. If they don't know what the cause of illness is, it's very difficult to train doctors any differently, and it's very difficult to arrange better preventative measures. So, until they can crack the mystery of what actually causes illness, there's not likely to be vast amounts of change. Let's move on. We're going to try this exam style question now. Explain why there was so much continuity in Renaissance surgery. This is a 12 mark question. This question is split between two different marks. You would get six marks for your knowledge, so it would need to be both accurate and relevant to what the question's asking, and six marks for your analysis, which is explaining why there is so much continuity. So really this question is all about causation. In the Edexcel exam, you'll be helped in some ways, and the exam answer will always, or the exam question rather, will always give you two stimulus points to work from. In this case, you may use the following in your answer, cause of infection, 
and training. But you must also use information of your own. That means that you can mention both of those things, but if you miss them out but include other things, you won't be penalised. On the other hand, if you only mention cause of infection and training, but nothing else, then you won't be able to get the full six marks for the knowledge. Here's a suggestion for how to answer this. If you prefer, you can pause the video here and try and remember from, uh, from your own memory and experience of answering these questions how to do it. If not, I'm going to provide you with a basic writing frame to work from. It's up to you how you want to complete this. What you need to do is include three point, example, explain and link paragraphs and a brief conclusion. That will ensure that there's enough knowledge in there to get all six knowledge marks and enough examples of linked analysis to the question in order to get you the six analysis question, uh, marks. So here's how you might structure it. Firstly, make a point. Remember, you don't actually need to write the headings of point, example, explain, etc. One reason for continuity in surgery was, an example of this was, the effect of this was or this involved, and then this led to continuity in surgery because. So you need three paragraphs like that. Again, try and do this from memory or from your notes in this lesson, and only use the writing frame if you have to. Once you've done those three paragraphs, you can include a brief conclusion. What was the most important problem or attempt to improve the surgery? Or what was the overall trend which explains why there was so much continuity? Whatever you decide, put it into a brief conclusion to explain why. Okay, this question is worth 12 marks and therefore you should spend between 18 and 20 minutes doing it. Certainly no more than that unless you are entitled to extra time in the exam and you should know whether you are or not. So pause the video now and good luck. Done? Let's have a look at an example answer. For the sake of clarity in this particular example answer, I'm going to colour code my point, example, explain and link paragraphs with these colours. Firstly, my first point, example, explain and link paragraph. One reason for continuity in Renaissance surgery was a lack of understanding of the cause of infection. OK, so I've used my first part of the stimulus material now. For example, barber surgeons in both the Middle Ages and the Renaissance did not know about bacteria as a source of infection. The effect of this was that neither took many precautions to prevent infection, such as sterilising tools. This led to continuity in surgery because without the knowledge of what caused infection, neither Middle Ages or Renaissance surgeons were able to uh, take precautions to prevent infections. Notice within this first paragraph I'm making some direct comparisons between the Middle Ages and uh, the Renaissance medicine. Although this is largely focused on the Renaissance, you'll find that real exam answers will often ask you to um, kind of look at two different periods and compare them. And so reading between the lines, this is what this question is actually asking you to do. So let's see what comparisons I make in my next one. Another reason for continuity in Renaissance surgery was a lack of training. That's the other stimulus point that we were given. As before, Renaissance surgeons were not formally trained. This meant that surgeons tended to not be respected and did not have access to the latest developments in the understanding of anatomy from the universities. This led to continuity as without access to new information or, and ideas, barber surgeons tended to learn as apprentices, learning the same techniques as the surgeons before them. So now I've got to include a point of my own. A final reason for continuity in Renaissance surgery was the effectiveness of their tools. The job of the barber surgeon in the Renaissance was little different to in earlier times, involving external surgery and amputations. The tools used for this, typically blades and saws, were still the most effective instruments for doing surgery. This resulted in continuity as the same tools remained effective and so were mostly not replaced with new tools or techniques. My conclusion. Overall, the biggest factor in causing continuity was that ideas had changed very little. The same knowledge, training and tools were used in both the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. This meant that there was little innovation in new surgical techniques. This led to continuity as the job of the barber surgeon changed very little as the needs of their job were virtually the same and until pare there were few changes in equipment and surgical methods. But I've mentioned a bloke called pare here, he did make changes in surgery in the renaissance. If you don't know anything about him yet I'll be producing another lesson on the achievements of pare and some of the other significant individuals in renaissance medicine. Maybe it feels like a bit of a cheat that I've included him in my example answer when you didn't learn about him this lesson. Oh well. You'll just have to find out, won't you? Anyway, make any necessary improvements to your own uh, answer now and make sure it's in a similar depth to this if you're going to pick up as many marks as you possibly can. If you're not going to do that, then that's the end of the lesson. I'll say thank you very much for watching and I hope that that was useful to you. If it was, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. But for now, good health.